Hi, I'm Darren Walters, and welcome to my podcast, In Session with Darren Walters. Today I have with me, from the Lawrence Welk Show, Mary Lou Metzger, and from Rocklands Entertainment, Mr. Brian Edwards. Today, Mary Lou will be chatting with Brian about his brand new 420-page hardcover book, Brian Edwards, The Promoter. You may not recognize the name Brian Edwards, but he has produced over 5,000 shows with over 100 different entertainers all across North America. Mary Lou is going to be sitting back and chatting with Brian about his behind-the-scenes stories with such artists as Stomp and Tom Connors, Tommy Hunter, Red Green, Charity Pride, and many, many more. Don't forget Brian's new book, The Promoter, is available online at briantheprimoter.com or by calling anywhere in North America at 1-800-465-7829. Would you please welcome Mary Lou Metzger. Hello, I'm Mary Lou Metzger. You might remember me from the Lawrence Welk Show. I was on there from 1970 on. But today I'm here to introduce you to a friend of mine who's the subject of a wonderful new book. It's called Brian Edwards, The Promoter. Now he's been in every city and town all across Canada, bringing you your most beloved entertainers. Legends like Stompin' Tom, Tommy Hunter, Kitty Wells, Rita McNeil, Charlie Pride, Red Green, and a hundred more. And you may not know Brian's name yet, but that's soon to change. Here he is, Brian Edwards. Well, thank you very much, Mary Lou. What a pleasure it is to be here today with you. And thank you very much for taking the time to spend a bit of time here with us. And we can reminisce about a lot of great fun we had on the road over the years and kind of how we got from there to here, for the lack of better words. And uh, I know we're going to have a really good time. I'm looking forward to it. We are. I'm so excited about this book. You call it the promoter. What exactly is a promoter? <laughs> Well, it's funny. They used to use the term agent many years ago. When I first got licensed through the Musicians Union, I was considered to be an agent. Well, I learned real quick with being an agent. First of all, you didn't never made any money. You had a lot of responsibilities that I didn't want. And you were in, basically in trouble for everything that happened, whether it's successful or not. So I thought, well, let me see what this promoter part of the business is all about. And being a promoter basically means you take full responsibility from everything, from the first phone call the last person leaving the auditorium at night. But I rather enjoyed that because it gave me a chance to kind of stay on top of everything. And if a mistake was gonna be made, I was gonna make the mistake and have to pay for it instead of somebody else making a mistake and I have to pay for it anyway. So I might as well go along and do the whole gamut. So from the first phone call to booking a hotel room, to booking advertising, to booking an auditorium, lining up stagehands, getting everything all ready to go. At the end of the day, when the curtain goes up, you know, you're the person that put it on and you hope to heck there's people in that audience to pay the bills. And luckily enough, over the years they were, and it turned out to be uh, quite a journey. Well, Brian, you're the best. But let's go back and start at the beginning. Now, you were born in a very small town, but you say your home was filled with music, that it was a musical wonderland. What, what do you mean? Well, it started, you know, my, funnily enough, my memory can go back a long way. And I can remember being in my grandmother's kitchen, even as a little wee kid, and her holding me up in her arms and singing old country music songs, or if the Tommy Hunter show come on television, she'd be dancing me around the, the, uh, the floor. And then when I moved into uh, Peterborough, um, my parents there were actually more into country music than I ever, you know, knew. Of course, I was very young at the time, but I certainly got got very educated rather quickly when almost every weekend we were having house parties at our house and uh, there was various country music artists from the area that would come in and they'd go to three or four o'clock in the morning or my dad being a square dance caller there was no such a thing as a babysitter in those days if you had a kid you took them with you not just the way it was so we go to all these local barn dances around and my father would call square dances all night so i learned how to square dance quickly my dad always taught me when you're out square dancing, you got to listen to the caller. And he made it very clear because if you seen I wasn't doing that, he'd jump right down in the square dance and he'd make sure I was. So I learned real quickly the value of entertainment. And I knew right off the bat that you didn't have to be in a 20,000 seat auditorium for people to enjoy entertainment. And that's kind of where it all started, where I was fascinated by that whole idea of people coming out and having a good time and dancing and singing and square dancing. And it really, it really was a good stepping stone, although... Going through all of that time, I never ever dreamt that I'd ever be in the music industry to any level whatsoever. But it certainly helped me when I did get into it 
to have the knowledge of all that country music and uh, what made what what made people happy. And uh, music makes people happy for the most part. Okay, so how did you go from being a 13 year old calling into a radio station to being a 17 year old <laughs> licensed promoter? <laughs> well, that's youngest kinda... in Canada, by the way, the youngest <laughs> licensed promoter. Well, that's kind of interesting because um, there's a radio announcer in Peterborough by the name of Sunshine Sean Air, and uh, because I grew up in the country music world, I, I, I tend to really like you know, really liked it. And in those days, the country music announcers were the personality of the community. There was no doubt about it. There are personalities everywhere. And he always had this deal where you could call in and request a song. So, of course, being a young kid and knowing how to use the telephone, that's what I would do. I'd pick up the phone and request a Stomp and Tom song so much it almost drove Sean crazy. But one thing kind of led to another, and I'd run into him at different functions, whether it was a remote that Sean was doing or speaking at a banquet or whatever it happened to be, he knew me because I was constantly phoning. I didn't give up even in those days. If I called somebody and they said no, that just gave me all the more fuel to call back again, and which I did. So one thing led to another, and I finally started to volunteer with Sean and uh, do little things. It didn't matter what it was. If he was going to be at a remote or something like that doing a radio broadcast, I'd come out and, if nothing else, unload his car with a couple of chairs in or something just to be part of it. And he invited me up to the station a couple of times and I could see what he was doing. And I quite became very interested in that, in that side of the business, still not ever expecting I'd ever get into anything, but he had me do two radio commercials. And the highlight of my day was my grade eight teacher would play those commercials for the whole class. It was a bit embarrassing, but as things got going on, I kind of rather liked it. I thought that was kind of neat. 11 o'clock, the commercial come on and my first one, my first line in a commercial was Captain Sir, and that was it. That was my whole line in the thing. But to me, I thought I'd won the boat and the motor. So when that kind of got going, Sean and I started to do a lot of different things together. And one thing led to another, and he ended up leaving the radio industry and starting his own company. And that's when we became really more involved. And uh, I worked around with him a lot. But what was interesting in those days, um, country music, radio announcers especially, were not in the good books of the musician union by any chance. They actually hated country music DJs, which was kind of strange because it was them that was playing the music of these artists that were putting out to help promote them. What they didn't want was a, a, a disc jockey becoming a promoter because it gave them an advantage. They could go on the radio station and push the artist to where they were going to be, and they kept pushing it till they sold it out. And Sean knew how to do that. I mean, let me tell you, he was a pro at it. But the union didn't like it at all. So finally, we got this nasty letter he did that he was going to be put on a blacklist, which meant in those days that you couldn't book any live entertainment that was union. And if you were, the union musicians would get kicked out of the union. That's how strict it was. It was a big deal, even in Peterborough. So I had applied for this booking license at the age of 17. Sean thought it was a good idea. And I said, well, let me, I'll show you this criteria. I mean, I'm 17 years old. I need a letter from the bank. I need four letters of support. And... Uh, there's, you know, so anyway, strangely enough, one of the letters was from Sean. So we go to, I go to this musician junior meeting and it's like a, an eight foot table. And there's like nine people sitting around this table and it's almost like a kangaroo court. They're just prodding me constantly, you know, how are you going to do this? And how are you going to do that? And, uh, and, uh, what kind of money have you got? Have you got money to back this thing up? And of course I didn't, but Everybody in that on that board knew that I didn't. They knew the whole thing, so it was kind of it's kind of a waste of time. But they went through the process. So anyway, once I convinced them that I thought I could do this thing, they took a vote. You're sitting right at the table. You're not asked to leave the room. I mean, the hands go up right beside you. So you know who likes you and who doesn't, real quick. But it ends up tied at four four. So the president of the musician union, he he knew Sean very well, and he just put his hand up, and of course. The ones that didn't like it were not very happy. And the ones that did like it, that knew what was going on, they uh, they were great. I mean, so to this day, uh, Rip Sanders of the Peter Rowe Musician Union was the deciding vote. And uh, 40 years later, I still got the plaque on my wall that uh, I pay my 100 bucks a year for my union card. And, and, and there you go. So that's how I got the Musician Union license. Sean and I carried on doing everything we always did anyway. There was no difference. Just that we had a booking license. And I ended up getting Sean a sub agent's license through the musician <laughs> union. It was even funnier because they issued that card out of Toronto because they didn't know Sean Air from Adam.
So it was it was quite funny actually how it all how it all worked out. <laughs> what was the first big show you booked? What was your big break? <laughs> well, this is a funny one. We were um, there was a festival in Peterborough called um, the Arts and Water Festival, and there was a guy that ran the festival many years ago named Fred Anderson in Peterborough, and Fred uh, started this festival and he'd retired and the gentleman by the Ron Gardner picked up the festival and he called Sean up and says, we want Tommy Hunter for this arts and water festival. And I mean, it was big money in those days. And uh, so we go ahead and, and, and I, I, I call Tommy cause he knew Sean quite well. So I call the house and Tommy says, well, call my, 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 my lawyer, Sam Lerner in London. He looks after everything. So I called him and one thing led to another. And he says, well, you know, we're going to need a deposit. We're going to need this and that. And who are you anyway? So I told him who I was. He says, does Tommy know you? And I said, well, so now here I am. So what do I say? I said, well, I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to get in here. So I said, well, he knows my dad well. Oh, who's your dad? So I told him, Sunshine Sean. So they just went along with that. And, and uh, we booked the show. So here they come into town. And it, it was pouring down rain. Just dry, it's, it's like a torrential storm. So we go to a local high school. And the place is absolutely jammed and Tommy's in there and doing his thing. And the thing works out great. Packed to the rafters. It's all good. So now it's time to pay Tommy the balance of the money. So he keeps saying, would you mind going get your father? And it's time to settle up this show, young fella. And I said, uh, so why would I want my father here? And he says, well, he needs to settle up with me. And I said, my dad didn't book this show. And he looked at me and he says, well, it certainly wasn't you. And I said, it certainly was. And he looked at me and he said, you're like a 50 year old to deal with. And he said, you're only 18. And I said, yeah. I said, I, 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 I'm able to think that way. So anyway, that was the start of a relationship that lasted 40 years and it still lasts today. I mean, I hear from Tommy Hunter probably four or five times a week still, although we don't do a lot of, we don't do any shows at all because he's retired, but there's still a lot of business with the television show and people to, that we have to follow up with and fan requests and all that stuff. And we still handle all that. So that started a 40 year relationship right here in town at the arts and water festival. Amazing. Thank you, Brian and Mary Lou. I hope you're enjoying today's podcast and part two is coming up in just the next few minutes. Don't forget if you're interested in buying this fantastic book, it's available at BrianThePromoter.com. Also by calling anywhere in North America at 1-800-465-7829. Now, here's a quick message from Red Green. Well, I met Brian in 2010. I had just flown in from somewhere and I was looking at the, you know, the airplane magazine I have. And inside there, there was a full page ad for a Stompin' Tom Connors concert. It looked pretty pro to me. And uh, I was also impressed that someone would promote a Canadian entertainer properly. You don't see a lot of that. And I looked down at the bottom and the whole thing was put on by a company called Rocklands Entertainment. Well, I made a note to try to remember that name, but I didn't have to. Because the next day, I was having a meeting with Brian Edwards, who's the chief honcho of, guess where, Rocklands Entertainment. Well, Brian had this idea that uh, he would take me out on tour. He said, we have a lot of fun, we make a little bit of money. I was skeptical, but uh, Brian had no doubts. Uh, you'll see a lot of that in this book. Uh, Brian doesn't waste any energy on doubts. Once he decides to do something, he just does it. And if he runs into a setback, he does it harder. Now, I've been with Brian at sold out shows and I've been with him when Hurricane Sandy destroyed our tour. Only 10% of the audience could even get to the theater and Brian gave the other 90% a full refund and he did it with a smile. That's another lesson you'll see in this book. Over the next 10 years, I did four North American tours with Brian from Tampa to Fairbanks and everywhere in between. We started out as business partners, then we became friends. At this point, we're more like brothers. You know, if you think you need to be rich or connected to make it in the entertainment business, you need to get your hands on this book. You've heard them say, you can't get there from here? Well, I guess I never said it to Brian. He wouldn't have paid any attention anyway. You know, I especially think young people need to read this book. Sometimes it's hard to find a path for yourself, right? But if you take Brian's recipe of brains, guts, hard work, and above all, treating people with respect, you're going to be okay. Hey, buy this book for a friend and tell him you want to read it when he's done. Uh, and oh yeah, keep your stick on the ice. Two words that I want you to elaborate on. Stompin' Tom. <laughs> 
a legend all well, the way. Well, well, well. <laughs> now, how long have we got here? <laughs> Tom goes back. Tom goes back on my life to about when I was about seven. He would. Uh, Peterborough played a big part in his life. He was here a lot. He would work a local bar in Peterborough here called the King George Hotel. Those days he came into town as a guy named Tom Connors, who had had a few songs by then, but he always had this habit of tapping his foot on the floor. It wasn't a tap, it was an actual stomp. He stomped right through the carpets on these, on these stages. I mean, this, when this guy got going, it would get going. So these club owners would say, now look, you do that one more time, I'm gonna throw you at the window. You can't be doing that. That's expensive stuff to do. So I can't help it, that's what I do. So he finally got to the point where this guy that worked with my father actually driving truck in Peterborough, which was kind of bizarre, his name was Boyd McDonald. He said, um, Tom, I'm gonna introduce you a little different tonight when I bring you on the stage. Cause he was a bartender also at this actual place he was working, slinging beer on Saturday nights. He said, well, Boyd, you do whatever you want. And he says, ladies and gentlemen, Stomping Tom, and his name stuck to him with him forever. And Tom picked up that handle, and away he went. But he'd come back to our house every once in a while for these house parties because you got to know everybody when you came to town, and they'd end up back there. Boyd and his wife Shirley and Tom and every other musician around Peter Rowe would end up at our house. So I became a real fascination of mine of watching this guy stomp his foot and sing about all the places in Canada writing these songs that all rhymed so everybody could sing them. I mean, it was school kids and everybody could go do these things without a problem. So my mom took me to see him in, in concert at, at the Peterborough exhibition here. And I was nine years old and Boyd had arranged for me to meet Tom back in this big tent that he had. And Tom was very famous for the cigarette in one hand and the beer in the other hand. And that's where he was. He worked a lot of nightclubs and that's just the, that's, that was his trademark. I looked up to him as a nine year old kid in that tent, <laughs> I thought I thought I was meeting, you know, um, uh, Paul Bunyan for God's sakes. It was this big guy standing there, and he he really had an effect on me. Well, of course, that's when all of us started to start requesting the songs with Sean on the radio, and then Tom disappeared. And in 1976, he he just packed everything in. But he he had won a bunch of what they call Juno Awards in Canada, and he was really upset at the system because. Basically, the way it was starting to work, if, you, if you're a Canadian, in order to make it, you had to move out of Canada. And Tom got saying, well, just hang on a sec. We can go work in all those places, but don't have to desert the country. And they wouldn't go along with that. So he just said, well, here, take your awards back. I'm leaving this industry. Well, nobody could contact him. Trust me, I tried. I wrote letter after letter after letter. And then he, um, he decided to do a television special up here with Katie Lang. He'd written a song called Lady Katie Lang. And I'd been to enough conventions and stuff by then. This was 1989. I didn't have a lot under my belt, but I knew you didn't do those things just because you wanted to do them. Something was going to happen. Either you're going to go out on tour, a new record was coming out. Nobody just, if you watch even today to see any promo going on, they don't have an act on there unless you're, unless you're the Johnny Carson show that just dropped by. You were on promoting something. And of course... I knew something was going to happen. So, of course, I'm back to the writing letters and absolutely nothing. So a gentleman by the name of Dean Cameron ran the record company in uh, Toronto. And I sent a couple of letters to him. But what was really funny, a phone call comes one day and this guy calls. He says, it's Jody Mitchell from uh, EMI in Toronto. He says, uh, do you know Wilf Carter? And I said, yeah, I do all his dates. He says, well, I really want to get a hold of him. And I said, well, can I pass along a message? And he says, well, yeah, we're having this party in Toronto in a couple of weeks and Stomp and Tom's going to come and sing a few songs. And I said, I wouldn't miss that for the world. <laughs> and the guy's stunned on the end of the phone. He's saying, um, well, I'll put you down for two. And I said, and I'll get a hold of Wilf. And God, Wilf's in his 80s at this point. There's no way he's ever going to be there in 100 years. But I wasn't going to miss it. So, of course, up I go. And what do I do? I write another letter because I knew I'm going to be in close enough quarters. I'm going to get this letter there somehow. So, of course, I got the slider there. He thanked me. We got a picture taken together. And, and, you know, he was sick as a dog that night, which was really funny. But he got up and did some songs. And Barbara and I weren't even married at the time. We both went to that show. And she said, you're shaking like a leaf. I said, this guy's got, I, 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 can't, I can't help it. I mean, he's, he's, really, he's really got me. And so 
I send the letter, and about three weeks later, I get this fax notable, four o'clock in the morning, which is typical Tom. That's his hours. I mean, from midnight to eight, he's right on. And the note just says, thanks, Brian. I'm considering a lot of different options. If I ever decide to tour again or I'm up your way, we'll have a beer, period. So, of course, weeks go by and weeks go by. So I'm going to take another crack at this Dean Cameron. So I send him another letter, and he forwards it on to Tom. So I get a call one day from a guy named Henry McGuirk. He calls and he says, um, would you like to go up to, to see Tom? And I said, well, who's this? And he says, I'm Henry McGuirk. I'm with Country Music News and da-da-da-da-da. And I said, well, hell yeah. And he says, uh, well, can you meet me? It was this side road way in the heck north of Toronto. And he says, can you meet me there at 9 o'clock on, uh, on um, a Tuesday night? He said, you must mean 9 in the morning. He said, no, no, no. I mean 9 at night. And I'm thinking, good God, I'm driving like it's three hours from home. 9 o'clock at night, we're just going to go up and say hello. So he drives me to this house way out in the middle of nowhere. Typical Tom, just in the middle. He's got a big fishing pond beside the house. Got this great big huge house. And so we go up there. And now Tom hasn't been on the road now in 14 years. And he hasn't, he's able to live off these royalties that he's had all these years. And I'm thinking, God, if anybody can do that in 1976, that's unbelievable. And 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 Tom gets this um he gets this piece of paper out finally at 2.30 in the morning after we talked, we really renew for five and a half hours. But remember, Tom's nocturnal. So by 5, 2.30 in the morning, he's just waking up. He's ready to go now. Anything you want to negotiate, and that's the best tactic you can ever have. Just wear everybody out first and you're good to go. So he gets in there and he pulls out this piece of paper. And it's got every town in Canada on this piece of paper. And not only that, but every venue that exists and how many seats are in it. Now, I'm stunned because I've never worked with anybody like this before. I'd been across the country. I've done this. I've done that. And then we start talking money and all this sort of stuff. And I, I mean, I finally said, uh, <clears throat> what? What's that? And he says, uh, you know, I says, um, I think this is, I think it's worth a million dollars. And I said, wow, is that all? <laughs> I said, would you like that in cash? Or would you like it, <laughs> you know? And he says, um, but I like you. And he says, I don't know why. He says, you've been able to work with Wilf Carter and Hank Snow. And he says, I know Hank Snow is one tough son of a gun. And he said, if you can work with him, you can work with anybody. And he says, you know all about these little small towns. He says, I've had four big agencies here in Toronto and they want to do 10 dates. He, I said, really? He said, yeah, from one coast to the other, 10. He said, could you imagine? And I said, no, I couldn't. He says, I want to do 70. And I said, wow, 70, no kidding. And he said, yep. And I said, well, that shouldn't take us long. That should take us about, you know, seven weeks. He says, seven weeks? He says, it's going to take us six and a half months. And I said, what are you doing, taking a few weeks off in the middle? He says, hell no. He says, I'm leaving this house. I'm not coming home. I said, well, what are we doing over a period of 180 days when we're only working 70 shows? He says, well, he says, you're not going to kill me out in that road. And I said, okay, what are we doing? He says, so <laughs> I want to work two and a half shows a week. I said, how do you figure that out? He said, I want to work three days one week and two days the next. He said, well, what are we doing the rest of the time? He says, well, hell, I want to go out and visit and have a good old time. And he says, I don't want to drive more than two hours a day, and I don't want to leave the hotel till 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And we'll start going. So I'm sitting there going, how the hell did I get myself into all of this? So I said, well, let me go home and think about it. He says, if you go home and think about it, we don't have a deal. We're either going to make this deal tonight or we're not going to have one. But this time, it's quarter to five in the morning. I've got this headache that it absolutely frightened you. And he's running to the house frightened Tylenol. So the rest of the night, he keeps calling me Headache Edwards. So he says, we're going to make a deal or not? And I said, well, we're going to try. But I said, I'm going to tell you the first thing. There's no way I've got enough money to finance 72 days across the road. He said, well, what the hell did you come up here for? And I said, well, nobody told me what I was coming up here for. I would have been more prepared. He said, as a promoter, you should be prepared. And I'm thinking, you know what? This guy's... He and I are gonna gonna get along just fine because I like his way of thinking, and I uh, I'm gonna think twice as hard as he does and see how how it works out. So anyway, at five after six in the morning, we shook hands on a deal that didn't cost me a dime, and was all a percentage deal. And then make it even better, three weeks after I left the house, 
A check came in the mail for 30,000 bucks from him to help me promote the tour. How do you like that? So here I was trotting across Canada with a legend with not a dime to do something like that. I mean, that was a big deal. I mean, those arenas and the advertising was just huge. So we got that tour under our belt and it was something else. I mean, my sister Ella went on every one of those dates. I had to get out of there. There's no way that I would make, I would never make it ever. I can't play croquet that much and I can't drive hundred miles a day and stop. When I, when I did the research more on Tom than I really knew, I mean, this guy lived out of a ditch for years and years and years and hitchhiked across the country. And most days they'd never even eat. So he had a, a real knowledge of the country. I mean, every blade of grass across Canada, he knew it. And he knew where he wanted to go and knew what he wanted to do. And he wrote in his book, he said, if Edward didn't come up with the deal, I was gonna do the damn thing myself. And he probably would have. And, but it was a relationship that was just second to none. I mean, we didn't always sit down at the table and hug and kiss each other and say how wonderful everything was. We, we, we had a great business relationship and we negotiated things out. I never left that house ever without having a deal done. And we always respected each other and got it done. And it was the most interesting experiences I've ever had in my life to this day. He's never been able to top them from going up to a, a deal with the queen of England in Ottawa and telling me I got to write these people and say, I don't care if it's the queen or not. My hat doesn't come off no matter what. So I'm writing these people. I get this letter back from Buckingham Palace saying, no problem, Mr. Edwards, uh, Mr. Connors can wear his hat. We're going to treat it as a religious headdress. So, <laughs> so he loved it. I mean, but he pulled things off that nobody else could pull off. And he, and he knew his audience inside and out. I mean, he knew exactly how to get to them and what they wanted. And, uh, you know, it's, it's one thing led to another with him. I mean, it was just one adventure to the next. I mean, he just, he attracted the elitists. He attracted the people that didn't have 10 cents to rub together. And in between, there was an audience there, about a 20 to a 25 year old male that would go crazy. And the, the age never changed. I did surveys in a 22 year period and that age bracket never changed. Now, this guy never got any radio airplay, never got anything. And yet that audience, had that base and boy, would they be supportive. And it wasn't all just guys either, a lot of young girls and stuff. And it, it was everybody. You'd get doctors and lawyers and hundred year olds and five year olds in there, sing along to every song. So it was a great experience for me. It was probably the best thing ever happened to me now that I think about it. Thank you for joining me today. This has been In Session with Darren Walters. I hope you enjoyed these great behind the scenes stories. If you'd like to hear more stories like this from other entertainers, producers, musicians, TV personalities, please look up my podcast at www.getmypodcast.com. That's www.getmypodcast.com. We'll see you next time. Thank you.